despair. 
darkness. The night was dark and dear. <laughs> Despite the glowing embers of the evening's roasted meal, it felt like darkness wanted to creep into their home as well. Bezalel had tried to calm his children and get them to sleep, but he couldn't even calm his own nerves, let alone theirs. Wide-eyed and huddled together, they waited for darkness to pass. Would it pass? Would death pass their house? <coughs> to say that these past few months had been stressful would be an understatement. Decades of brutal slavery had finally come to a great conflict. Not that Bezalel and his people had taken up arms. To the contrary, they had done very little besides their slavish work. It had been Moses with his brother Aaron, who had confronted Pharaoh, deified as the sun god, Pharaoh's heart was darker than the grave. Bezalel had heard the stories as a child and had told them to his children how, how Pharaoh had ordered all his people to drown every newborn Hebrew baby boy, and how Pharaoh had ordered how Moses had been rescued from the Nile by a palace princess, and how for the past 80 years his people had been oppressed, enslaved, and impoverished. But how Moses had come back with an unbelievable story of meeting The God of their ancestors. The God who had revealed his name, Yahweh. I am who I am. Had heard their cries. Had come to rescue them. And Yahweh had gone to battle for them. Had gone face to face with Pharaoh himself. And one by one, the gods of Egypt had been utterly powerless against Yahweh. Water had turned into blood, and frogs had flooded the land. Nets had covered their bodies, and flies had formed the sky. Disease had killed livestock. Hail had ruined crops, boils blistered their skins. Locusts devastated all vegetation, and darkness had blocked the light of day. Darkness. <coughs> For 80 years they had felt the darkness of helplessness and hopelessness. Darkness. And finally, the Egyptians had experienced the darkness of their own despair. And darkness awaited the dawn, and Bezalel and his family were waiting for dawn. They had eaten in haste, quickly baked bread without the leaven, and killed a lamb and roasted it on fire. They had eaten it with their neighbors so that none of it would be left. And the blood of the lamb had been painted on their doorposts. Would it be enough to ward off God's final judgment to the death of the firstborn sons? Would the destroyer pass over their house upon the side of the blood of the Lamb's blood? It had taken all the faith that Bezalel could muster to wait for their freedom. Faith in Moses, who had given the instruction, instructions for this Passover meal. Faith in Yahweh, who had revealed himself through each of the nine plagues. Faith that the blood 
of the Lamb would cover his house, his family, and his people. Darkness. The night was dark and eerie. And suddenly, around midnight, the wailing of Egypt filled the sky. Perhaps you can relate to such darkness, to dark nights of the soul, when all you can do is wait for the dawn, hope that the light of day will dispel this darkness, or perhaps it's worry about medical reports that have cost you sleepless nights, or maybe the loss of work and uncertainty of a future career, or the next meal. Perhaps anxiety about conflicting relationships with your spouse, with a friend, with a colleague, and the suffering of a family member back home, far away, and unable to help. Somehow, the darkness of night seems to intensify the fear and our doubts. When we're left alone to our thoughts huddled, we wait for the dawn. So you can imagine the dark night that the Israelites went through during the tenth plague. And yet somehow during the night, their fear had turned into faith. And their faith had found freedom. Moses had said that at midnight the Lord would go throughout Egypt and that every firstborn son in Egypt would die. Of Pharaoh, of the slaves, even of the cattle as well. Every firstborn would die. Unless they were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Every firstborn male belongs to me, the Lord had declared, both human and animal. But the firstborn sons are to be redeemed with a lamb. And so in faith, Israelites had followed the Lord's Passover instructions and had led them to freedom. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be the first month, the first month of your year. And tell the whole community that Israel, that on that day, tenth day of this month, each man is to take the lamb for his family, one for each household. And if any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with each person, what each person will eat. The animal you choose must be a year old male without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats, and take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they will eat the lambs. Nothing had to go to waste. And all would be eaten of these lambs. And a male lamb had to be perfect, not lame, not sick, not blemished. And they had to take care of them for four days. To make it even more personal that this lamb would die for their redemption. But that same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it until morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it. 
with your cloak tucked in your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses. Where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. If it were me, I would probably leave the organs and burn them this next morning. But the Lord said this tenth plague would be a judgment on all Egypt's gods. None of them could stop him. All of them were powerless. I am the Lord, God said. Yahweh, the God of Israel, the one and only true God. And so you can imagine the joy at dawn when they discovered that Israel's firstborn were still alive. When they heard that Pharaoh had called Moses and Aaron during the night, and when he had finally relented and ordered Israel to leave, women, children, flocks, herds, everyone. And when the Egyptians urged them to hurry, afraid for their own lives, and gave them everything that they had asked for. Their gold and their silver, their clothing and cloths. This had become a payment for 80 years of unpaid slavery, of their brutal treatment, of the early deaths that they had experienced. And many of the Egyptians and many other ethnic people had decided to join them, to go with them. After 430 years in the land, fear had turned to faith and turned to freedom. And that fateful night was to be commemorated forever through Passover. And this Passover meal was followed by another week of a festival, celebration of unleavened bread. And by redeeming of every firstborn son or every firstborn livestock with the sacrifice of a perfect lamb. God said, obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as He promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over our houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. And the people bowed down and worshipped. All resulted in worship of Yahweh, the great I am, the one true God. And so the Passover meal has been celebrated for three and a half thousand years since. And today, Jews still continue to dramatically celebrate the Passover meal as if they themselves were participants in the story. It's not just a, a reminder of historical events, but it's a journey that brings them back into history as if they were really there as if they were really the slaves in Egypt awaiting the dawn of freedom in darkness fear had turned into faith faith had turned into their freedom and through the tenth plague God revealed himself as the God who redeemed 
dictionary says that redeem means to compensate for the faults or bad aspects of something or to gain or regain possession of something in exchange for payment. And so the Egyptians had to make payment for the infanticide, for the killing of infant sons of the Israelites. Because God said that all people and all creation belong to the Lord, and yet He only claims the firstborn, the first fruits. But Israel could redeem the firstborn son with the sacrifice of a perfect lamb. The blood will be a sign, God has said, for the payment, for the exchange, for redemption. God who redeems, He compensates for our faults and gives us life in exchange for His judgment. The day was dark and eerie. Darkness had come early that day. At noon, the sun had stopped shining. It felt like darkness wanted to creep into their souls as well. Peter had wanted to comfort his brothers, give them assurance, but he himself had despaired. He had denied his master. He had run away. Wide-eyed, huddled together, they waited for darkness to pass. Would it pass? Would death also follow them? Well, to say that these past few days have been stressful would be an understatement. Decades of brutal oppression had finally climaxed into a conflict. Not that Peter and the others had picked up arms. To the contrary, they had done very little besides following their master. No, it had been Jesus of Nazareth who had confronted the powers, not with the Roman authorities, but with their own religious leaders. And one by one, Jesus had challenged the religious sects of Israel, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, the rebellious zealots. They all despised him hated him and wanted him dead. And in darkness, Jesus had been betrayed by his own. In darkness, they had arrested him, beat him, mocked him. In darkness, Peter had denied him three times, deserted him. Dark. That dawn they had tried him and accused him and sentenced him. By nine they had flogged him and paraded him and crucified him. And by noon darkness had come over the land and the sun had stopped shining. Darkness had swept over their hearts as well because they had run. Darkness, while the women awaited at the cross, the men hid themselves. Darkness awaiting dawn. And Peter and his brothers awaiting the dawn. Peter remembered the last meal they had the day before. They had celebrated the Passover together, the twelve, with Jesus. Unleavened bread had been prepared in haste. Bitter herbs had remembered, reminded them of their slavery. And the Passover lamb was there to remind them that God himself had redeemed Israel. The blood of the Lamb had been the sign for death to pass over them. But darkness had overshadowed their joy when Jesus said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Jesus had taken bread and given thanks and broken it and given it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. Broken. This body for me, for us. Peter remembered, but he did not understand why was Jesus' body broken? Beaten, shredded, pierced, nailed to a cross? Darkness. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Blood poured for me, for us. Peter remembered, but he didn't understand why Jesus' blood poured so free from his mouth, from his brow, from his back from his hands and his feet. Darkness, the day that was dark and eerie. And suddenly, around mid-afternoon, the wailing of the women filled the skies. So can you imagine the darkness the disciples went through that day those two nights, and yet somehow through darkness, their faith had turned, their fear had turned into faith and into freedom. Jesus had said he would be betrayed, mocked, abused, and killed. He'd also said that he would rise again on the third day. And despite the fear, Jesus had faith in the hope that was set before him. And through his faithful obedience unto death on a cross, he had been made perfect. The perfect Passover lamb that would take away the sins of the world. To redeem all who believe and to buy freedom for all who put their faith in him. And so imagine the joy when on the third day during the evening meal, Jesus appeared to the disciples who had been huddled and hiding in darkness. When he showed them the wounds on his hands and his feet. When he ate the piece of broiled fish to prove to them that he wasn't a ghost. And when he opened their minds and they suddenly understood from scripture that the Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all nations. It wasn't until much later in Peter's life, before his own crucifixion, that he was able to put it succinctly into words. That the mystery of Jesus' death the meaning of Christ's blood, the redemption of God paid for salvation of all mankind by sacrificing His one and only firstborn Son as the perfect Passover Lamb. And Peter wrote, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, and was revealed in these last times for your sake, and through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him so your faith and hope are in God. And like the first Passover, the second Passover was to be commemorated forever. So when we gather together and partake of the bread and the cup, 
It is not just a reminder of historical events, but it's a journey back into history, as if we were really there, as if we were slaves to our the dawn in darkness, where fear turns into faith, turns into freedom. And so it was through the tenth plague that God revealed himself as God who redeems. The Egyptians had to pay for their crimes and their cruelty with the death of the firstborn, while the firstborn of the Israelites were redeemed with the blood of a perfect Passover lamb. And Israel's fears had turned into faith and then turned into freedom of their slaves. And so it is through the crucifixion of Christ that God once more redeemed His people. That God paid for our crimes and our wrongdoings with the death of His firstborn. And that through the resurrection of Jesus, that He is the firstborn from the dead. So that our fear may turn into faith and may turn into freedom eternal life. But perhaps you are here this morning and you do not have this faith. You do not know this freedom. And perhaps you have fear of tomorrow, of the future, of life after death. The Bible says today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. And Pharaoh had hardened his heart. He could not escape God's judgment. But today, open your hearts towards God. And accept His redemption. That He paid for all our debts. That He forgave all our wrongs. And that He loves us so dearly that He had given His one and only Son for us. It is by that faith in Jesus Christ, in His death and in His resurrection, that you will be free. Because if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Let us pray. Lord, we thank You for the Passover story. And Lord, as I read on it, studied it, meditated on it, I realized that it's so dramatic. And it's beyond my imagination what it would have been like for the Israelites to go through that fearful night, to grasp on to any strand of faith in the hopes for freedom. But you've proven yourself to be the Redeemer. You have proven yourself to free your people out of slavery and lead them to the promised land. And how this parallels with the story of crucifixion, how Christ through a fearful night with faith surrendered himself to a cross as the perfect Passover land. That He is your payment for our redemption, for our sin and wrongdoing. And that we, though we are fearful, might have faith in Him. And that you might lead us to freedom and everlasting life. Thank you for Jesus Christ, your perfect Passover life. And as we celebrate communion today, may, not, may it not just be a, a reminder of some historical facts but may you take us back to that moment so that we might participate in that story as if we were really there so that it may mean so much more to us today and that you oh God and Father gave us your one and only son as our Passover
when it's not the first Sunday of the month. But since we're talking about Passover and crucifixion, we want to celebrate communion this morning. And I hope that through this story, it's becoming more meaningful to you, even this morning. So I want to ask the ushers to come forward. And this morning we will come to the table, row by row. You can take a piece of bread, you take one of the cups, take it back to your seat, and wait so that when we all have the bread and the cup, we will partake of communion together. But if you are here this morning, and you have not yet decided to follow Jesus, maybe you still have a lot of questions. Maybe it's the first time you are in a church. We're so glad that you are here. But we want to ask you to stay seated and not to partake of communion. Communion is for those who believe in Jesus and who have faith in Jesus Christ, death and resurrection, and who have been brought to free. But if you would like to know more about Jesus, our prayer counselors will be available after the service, and we'd love to talk with you and to pray with you. But for now, I just want to invite the artists.